Hi everyone, today we will talk about CUDA, which is a powerful software platform that helps computer programs run faster. Now we often use it to solve performance intensive problems, such as cryptocurrency mining, video rendering, and of course, machine learning. But CUDA is not just software, it is also embedded in hardware. So only those of us who have an NVIDIA graphic card can access it. But wait a second, isn't our processor in charge of running computer programs? How come our graphic card can do it and better? That's not even his official job. So before we dive any deeper, let's quickly talk about how processors and graphic cards operate. A processor or a central processing unit, also known as CPU, is in charge of all the mathematical and logical calculations of our computer. So its main purpose is to run instructions, which we commonly know as code. So every time we interact with a program, every time we copy or delete files, or even when we type a single letter inside a text document, all these tasks are performed by the CPU. Additionally, all the communication between the different computer components also relies on the CPU. So the components, they do not communicate to each other directly but they have this CPU middleman in between. So for example, the hard drive knows nothing of the keyboard, but thanks to the CPU, we can combine their powers and use the keyboard to rename files on the hard drive and things of that sort. So CPUs then must be really good at multitasking because we are always able to run a bunch of applications at once. We are able to download files through the browser while listening to Spotify, while scanning for malware, while using our mouse and keyboard for a thousand different things. But surprisingly, this is not exactly the case. The core of our CPU can only handle one task at a time. This core is an independent processing unit and our multitasking abilities directly depend on how many cores our hardware has. And here's the thing, the most advanced and newest CPU on the market only has 16 cores. And I mean it in terms of products that regular people can buy in the store, not industrial grade rocket launching products. In fact, most of us are working with as little as two up to eight cores per CPU, but we never notice any issues. And the reason is CPUs are incredibly fast. They run so fast that humans can't even notice that our tasks are being executed in a sequence instead of all at once. So then CPUs are generally not so good at multitasking. Yeah, they're fast, but they're also quite limited when it comes to running things in parallel. But how about graphic cards? A graphics card or a graphics processing unit, also known as GPU, is in charge of displaying images on your screen. Now, modern GPUs are extremely powerful because often they come with their very own memory and their very own processor. Now, GPUs help execute code in parallel as well as offload processing on the CPU. So then when you're playing a video game, for example, instead of sending every little frame and every little movement to your CPU, where a bunch of calculations are made and then they are sent back to your GPU so that you can see the changes on your screen, GPUs can skip this unnecessary communication and provide you with a much better gaming experience, a much faster one. But how come GPUs are faster at running instructions than CPUs? It's not really their primary purpose, so how can they do it better? Now, can you guys make a guess of how many cores a modern GPU has? And please be extra generous, because what I'm about to say will shock you. So if the most advanced CPU at the moment has 16 cores, the most advanced GPU has 10,496 of them. Yeah, specifically, NVIDIA's RTX 3090 has 656 times more cores than Intel's i9 12th gen processor. Now, can you guys imagine what it means in terms of multitasking? We can essentially run over 10,000 more processes on our graphics card than on our CPU at any given point of time. Well, at least in terms of these two product lines. 
So if that's the case, why do we even need CPUs? Let's just get rid of them and use GPUs instead. But there's just one problem. Sometimes multitasking is not the best solution. In some cases, running tasks in parallel takes up much more time and much more resources than just solving the problem one step at a time. That's why having CUDA run code in parallel is so handy. It allows you to switch between CPU processing and GPU processing for very specific tasks. That way, when writing programs, you can pick and choose exactly when to use which piece of hardware. So we essentially gain much more control over how our computer operates. Now, you may have already been using CUDA without even knowing it, as applications such as Adobe Creative Suite are already utilizing it. But how exactly can we use it in our own applications? How can we access it and combine it inside our Python code? So let's start by installing CUDA. And as a pre-installation step, we will first verify that our GPU is indeed capable of CUDA. To do this, we will type inside the terminal NVIDIA SMI list GPUs. Now, in my case, I'm working with GeForce RTX 3090. So we will just make a quick note of that and we will navigate to the link I've provided in the description. Now, on this link, you can find all the CUDA enabled GPUs that NVIDIA has to offer. And if your GPU is anywhere on that list, everything is perfect. You can just move on with the CUDA installation. So in my case, I'll navigate to the GeForce series where we can indeed find my GPU. Awesome. Now let's move on with the installation. Now there are several ways to install CUDA, but in this tutorial, we will do this inside an Anaconda working environment. Now, if you guys are not familiar with Anaconda, I'm including a special tutorial in the description, which will get you up to speed. And if you guys are not big fans of Anaconda, I'm also including equivalent VN commands as well, so that we all have a nice alternative. So in our case, we would like to start from zero with a brand new working environment. So let's create it first. We will type conda create n, and we will select a name for our environment. In my case, I'll call it ML machine learning, and we will install Python 3.9 inside. We will confirm with Y, and we will activate this environment with conda activate ML. Perfect. And once we are inside our working environment, we can then go ahead and install CUDA. Now, many of us will be tempted to install CUDA directly with the following command, conda install dash C anaconda CUDA toolkit. However, this version of the CUDA toolkit may not be compatible with other packages, which we also would like to install in this environment, for example, PyTorch. So let's try something else. Instead of installing CUDA first, we will begin by installing PyTorch. We can do this by typing conda install dash C PyTorch PyTorch. And look at that. So it seems that by installing PyTorch, we are also automatically installing the CUDA toolkit. And the best part is PyTorch already knows which version of the CUDA toolkit will work best for it. So this is a win-win situation. So let's scroll down and we will confirm with why. And congratulations, you guys have just installed CUDA. And now we can go ahead and start coding. Now, in my case, I'm going to do this through Jupyter Notebook, but feel free to use any code editor, any IDE. It doesn't really matter. So this step is absolutely optional. So I'm installing Jupyter Notebook with Conda install dash C Anaconda Jupyter. And I'm going to run it with Jupyter Notebook. Cool. Now I'm going to create a brand new Python file, Python 3 file. And the first thing I'm going to do is to double check that our CUDA installation was successful. To do this, we will import torch as in PyTorch. And we will then check if torch.cuda is available. And if everything worked and our installation was successful, this line of code will return true. Now let's run it with shift enter. And there you go. We have successfully installed CUDA. Perfect. But actually, this command is slightly ambiguous. Usually you will see something along the lines of if 
torch CUDA is available, then device equals torch device CUDA. Otherwise, device equals torch device CPU. And then right below, there will be some kind of a print statement saying that using device device. Let's rerun it. Okay, and now this is way more informative. Let's move on. Now, our plan is to perform a quick speed test. So we will create two extremely complex data structures, and we will then measure how much time it takes for each device to multiply them. To do this, we will first import the time module, which will help us with the timing, of course, and we will then create a new variable called matrix size, which we will set to 32 times 512. Now, if this size is a bit too big for your computer, you can always adjust it to 32 by um, 64 or pretty much any other number, as long as you multiply this number by 32, because 32 here represents something called a batch size. And we will talk about it in detail in future tutorials, but for now, just make sure you include it. Next, we will create the first data structure completely out of random numbers. We will call it x and we will assign it to torch.rendn, as in random numbers, and then inside the round brackets, we will set the size to be matrix size by matrix size, which is an enormous amount of values. So we will just copy this line of code, we will paste it in the next line, and we will create our second data structure, which we will call y. Cool? Now let's move on with the speed test, and we will begin with the speed of our CPU. So we will print CPU speed, and in the next line of code, we can actually start timing. So we will create a variable called start, and we will set it to time dot time which represents the current time. Next, we can move on with multiplying our matrices by typing torch dot, oh, torch dot metmul, as in matrix multiplication, and we will then pass into the round brackets our x and y data structures. And actually, let's assign this expression to a variable called result. And then once we are done calculating, we can just simply print the current time with time dot time minus the start time. And lastly, we will verify that we're using the correct device. So we will print verify device along with result dot device. And that's pretty much it for the CPU. Now let's move on with the GPU. And before we start timing, we need to load our data structures into CUDA. To do this, we will type at the very bottom of our code x.2, and inside the round brackets, we specify device. And if you guys remember, we have already set our device to CUDA in the cell above. And to be extra cautious, I'm actually going to assign this expression to x GPU instead of just reassigning it back to x. And we can do the exact same thing with y, so we will copy this line of code. We will paste it below and we will adjust X GPU to Y GPU and X to Y. And now we can start timing CUDA. So we will copy the print statements from above, including the timing commands, and we will paste them at the very bottom of our code. Now we can adjust CPU speed to GPU speed. We will adjust result to result GPU. We'll do the same thing for X and Y. So X becomes X GPU and Y becomes Y GPU. And the last thing we'll need to change is inside our verify device command, where we change result to result GPU. But that's not all. We need to keep in mind that our CPU doesn't just stop and wait for the GPU to finish processing. It actually keeps executing the rest of our program while the GPU is still calculating. So we need to find a way to politely ask our CPU to hold on until the GPU finished. Otherwise, we'll be printing the speed results before we even finished multiplying our matrices. So there's an actually very easy way to do this. Below our loading to CUDA commands, we will type torch.cuda.synchronize. And this command is basically freezing our CPU 
up until the moment that our GPU has finished loading both our data structures. And then we will need to call it once again. So let's copy this line of code and we will then paste it after we are done multiplying our matrices, matrices. <laughs> and then lastly, we will actually wrap our GPU speed test in a for loop. So for I in range three. So we will repeat this speed test three different times. We will then um, indent the next lines of code. And the reason why we do it is because the very first time we perform our matrix multiplication with CUDA, there is an extra process happening in the background. So it's sort of a setup step, which takes up time. So the most fair thing to do is just to repeat this uh, speed test three different times and make sure that we're getting the best results. Let's go ahead and run this code. So we will press on kernel and we will press on restart and run all. Restart and run all cells. All righty, let's take a look at the results. So the speed of my CPU is 8.46 seconds, while the speed of my GPU is 0 0.26 seconds. Wow, <laughs> we're looking at ratios of one for the CPU and 32.5 for the GPU, which is incredible. But keep in mind that this was a relatively simple task. So even though the results are very impressive, we're not even close to maximizing the capabilities of our GPU. So we will of course learn how to do this in future tutorials. This one is just an introduction. So we do simple things. Now I actually have a very cool idea. What if we post our speed results along with what kind of CPU and what kind of GPU we're working with. And if you changed anything in the matrix size, also please mention it. And then within a few weeks, I'll be able to go over the entire comment section. I'll be able to copy your speed results and organize them in some kind of a table or some kind of a database, which we can all access. And then we will have this super convenient list of um, equipment benchmarks, let's call it. So if you guys wanna participate, please comment your speed results below and any additional information about your hardware. I will really, really appreciate it. Now I ran the speed test a few more times just to make sure that these results are not a coincidence. And if you guys are curious to find out um, how it looks like for a 32 by 64 matrix, let's rerun this cell. And this time we're looking at a one to six or one to seven kind of ratio. So it seems that when we're dealing with extremely complex operations on extremely complex data, then our GPU really shines. So the more complicated the task, the better GPU performance we get. And the last thing we will talk about is why our device is CUDA zero instead of just CUDA. So what this zero represents is our primary GPU. Now, in my case, I'm working only with a single GPU, but some of us have systems with multiple GPUs. So whenever we specify our device, instead of just specifying CUDA, we can actually specify CUDA at a certain index. Now the primary GPU, as I mentioned, is index zero, while the secondary GPU is index one and so on. Cool, now this tutorial was a brief introduction to CUDA. In the next few tutorials, we will dive in much deeper and we will mostly focus on machine learning. So we will talk about pre-trained neural networks and we will also talk about inference with TensorRT. So I am very excited. Now, thank you guys so much for watching. If you found this tutorial helpful, please share it with millions upon millions of people or at least a few, it's a good start. If you like this video, please leave it a like. If you have anything to say, please leave me a comment. Maybe subscribe to my channel and of course, turn on the notification bell. Now I will see you guys very soon in a brand new tutorial, so don't go very far.